this is Svetlana from Marco Sevens. Thank you all for attending today's webinar, Unlock Quick Data-Driven Decisions by Automating Your Budgeting and Planning Process, brought to you in partnership with JetDox. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. As you can see at the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A session, but if a full answer is needed or we run out of time, we'll make sure to follow up with you in a separate email after the webinar. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or bookmark any links you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. Please expect an email within two hours after the webinar with links to download the webinar slides and recording. At this point, I'd like to briefly introduce you to our moderator and host of the webinar, Mark Feltais, Asia-Pacific Director at JDOX. Mark, it is over to you now. Yeah, thank you, uh, Svetlana. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, welcome to this uh, panel session. As Svetlana outlined, my name is Mark and I'm responsible for JEDOX across the region here in Asia Pacific. Today I'm uh, presenting from uh, sunny Sydney. I'm normally based in, uh, in, in Singapore and uh, JEDOX has been around since uh, 2002. We bring um, people like yourself uh, solutions to uh, budgeting, forecasting, planning challenges and reporting. Um, so today I've got uh, two guests with me. I would like to introduce them to you. Um, first is uh, Saja. Uh, she's from uh, Schindler and the CFO there. And Sanja, uh, may I ask you to briefly introduce yourself to, to the audience? Sure. So this is Sanja Sharma, based out of Mumbai. Uh, a very interesting combination of things at uh, at this moment in time. I'm taking care of finance, uh, which is impacted by inflation and many other things. But at the same time, I'm taking care of the factories, the elevators in India. So being impacted by chipsets and all other shortages as well. So as I said, uh, in love to be on this forum. Looking forward for an enriching experience and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sanja. Thanks for introducing yourself. And the second uh, speaker that we have today is uh, Ravi. Ravi joins us uh, from Johnson & Johnson, responsible finance transformation within that part of the business. Uh, Ravi, would you mind giving us a, a quick introduction of yourself? Sure, thanks, Mark. Hello everyone, I am Ravi. Uh, I am with Finance Transformation here uh, uh, here in Johnson & Johnson, Asia Pacific. I am based in Singapore. Uh, it is an ever-changing dynamic uh, world and finance has to continue to thrive going forward. So that's why the transformation uh, you know, we are doing within the organization and I'm part of this team. I have been with Johnson & Johnson for around uh, 20 years working across uh, different uh, functions like finance, supply chain and the short stints in commercial and audit. Uh, and uh, uh, I've worked across multiple geographies in India, in uh, Singapore, and in Vietnam. So happy to be here and share my insights and thoughts. Uh, and yeah, let's let's have a great session. Thank you. Fantastic. So two very experienced uh, individuals here on this call. We got a lot of lot of knowledge, and we're going to be talking about specifically uh, data automation uh, within the office of finance. And Ravi, I'm going to start by asking you. A question um, we can see it here on on the slide but can you give us your perspective on on how planning budgeting forecasting has evolved over the last 10 years and what you have seen happen in the office of finance sure mark uh, let me reflect on my own experience and and answer this uh, question uh, increasingly, leaders across uh, the levels right in the organization have come to realize that the plan I make today will probably need to change by tomorrow. Uh, it's a very dynamic and external you know, environment uh, with rapidly evolving customer needs, 
so therefore, uh, I am seeing three key themes uh, emerge when it comes to the planning and budgeting and forecasting processes. Uh, number one, we are moving towards a more uh, free, uh, less frequent, uh, sorry, uh, we are moving from a scenario where we were doing less frequent and more detailed plans to more frequent and high level plans. So that's that's number one. We are also creating more scenarios versus what we used to do earlier. And we are actually also leveraging historical actual data to then percolate those high level plans into lower level of detail. And that's where a good planning tool certainly becomes critical. So that's one, uh, which is moving towards a more frequent and high level plan. The second uh, piece which I see is uh, the siloed nature of planning, uh, which, which uh, you know, I had experienced early part of my career, is now given way to more integrated approach to planning, where all the functions are marching to the same beat and creating more integrated you know, plans. And the third one is, um, as finance professional, uh, you know, I was in early part of my career, I was really involved in driving and managing the whole planning and forecasting process, you know, coordinating with different functions, sending them templates, getting the fill template from them, loading into a common system platform and so on and so forth. And now uh, we are moving towards a more uh, system enabled self-service, you know, input model where different functions have that uh, flexibility and a self-service model available in the system to put in their their idea of the future, you know, forecast, and and uh, the system has the ability to translate some of those insights into numbers. So, so those are the key th three themes I'm I'm seeing, uh, Mark. Yeah, and you know what? What you're just discussed is is literally the stuff that I hear on a daily basis. Uh, specifically, your first point around continuous planning, um, and therefore automation, and we'll get to that later on in the discussion, is going to play a massively important role, right? Um, all right, I got another question, and this one is for you, uh, Sanja. Is uh, clearly there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. We've got Ukraine, we've got COVID, we've got supply chain issues, we've got uh, inflation around the corner, um, and in some countries, very alive today. How are you addressing the impact of all those factors in in your daily and your your monthly, quarterly budgeting and forecasting cycle? Uh Thanks for the question, and I see myself grappling with it uh, practically every day. Uh, two days I was uh, across the country meeting customers with some more get their perspective of what is happening and how are they impacting, uh, they are being impacted by inflation and supply chain issues. So a uh, couple of things which I would like to highlight first is uh, earlier finance was driving many things on their own um, and not getting much involved in the business. I see now that is a different change. I have to meet all sets of the business and ensure that I know the reality to, to drive it well. So, like I cannot manage the inflation. If I just talk to my marketing or sales team, they will say price increase is never a good idea. But if I meet customers, I understand that um, they are also facing this and they have price increases across. So it becomes easier for me to drive that. Uh, second is supply chain issues. A biggest learning for many of us is, um, sorry to use a geopolitical issue, but depending on one country. Um, this is the right time to re go to the drawing board and understand is the supply chain um, overly dependent on certain geopolitics or on certain geography, which is not which is not helping us. Like uh, we do not have material in uh, Australia because we supply from China and China is under lockdown. So this is um, this is the second. Uh, part of the uh, story, but the third and very important part is that we are, um, I would say, sometimes undermine our vendor relationship and the, the strategies that we have uh, on dual sourcing, on vendor procurement, or on vendor relationship. This needs to be strong because only that can help us prioritize over something else. 
otherwise if i am as good as any other uh, customer for the vendor um, it's not going to help us and for me my customers are standing in queue to get the material so yeah. to bridge the story in short it's very important that we have our business understanding very well as finance professionals to to help and understand the market scenarios and push things uh, know the whole piece of vendor management very well so that we we can manage things in the short a uh, short uh, time frame but the last mm-hmm. thing is connects all these things is people and people are the greatest asset which covid has taught us if we have the right kind of people everything can be managed but if yeah. we don't have that uh, it becomes a biggest biggest concern yeah, yeah. But, but uh, thanks i, I mean you, uh, if there's no right or wrong answer everyone is trying to struggle in their own way i would say yeah Yeah and 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 uh, you you finished on a on a very good point right people uh, we actually will talk about that a little bit later on um there is no right answer to this question uh, i fully agree so i'm going to ask sanjay oh, sorry i'm going to ask you ravi as well um h- how how do you look at this uh, specific topic yeah i mean fantastic points by uh, sandhya and let me let me build on it uh uh climate right and let me take an example and and make it uh, you know tangible on how we are dealing with it many of our products in johnson and johnson are tied to weather and climate in the sense that you know it's it's very hot certain kind of products the sales would just go up um and uh, certain products uh, you know are sold when uh, when due to climate and weather conditions uh, you know certain uh, kind of uh, uh viruses are more prevalent in certain markets and therefore uh, sale of certain antibiotics and so on and so forth would would ramp up uh, these days uh, and and for for last many many years this used to be very predictable we would know that there will be summer at certain point in time you know spring winter and so on and so forth it was fine and okay uh, and then you could plan your supply chain right to make sure that the right quantity uh, is delivered at the right place uh, so that our customers you know get what they need now with the ever changing uh, climate uh, right and uh, with lot of surprises the climate is throwing up supply chain disruptions are very common you know you suddenly get a huge demand from a certain market which you never have expected uh, so so therefore how do we how do we then uh, you know go go back and uh, prepare for it so two things two critical things one is continuous monitoring of uh, your external environment including climate weather geopolitical conditions and so on and so forth and the second one is to be prepared with scenarios uh, and that's where it's very important again i'll come back to that point about uh, which we sandhya was making that it's no longer finance you know making those plans uh, we will have to be in touch with customer supply chain vendor because it's an integrated world uh, and, and and you can build as many scenarios but if you have to suddenly transition them into action you need all the pieces of the puzzle to fall in the on fall in place at the right time right so that that makes it very critical and important so yes uh, absolutely these factors are important and it therefore we need to be more agile in the way we plan and connect with our stakeholders yeah 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 and in both your answers i hear a lot around control the controllable right there there's so many factors outside that that are very difficult to control but what you can do is use that feed into your organization and at least understand what is happening and uh, hopefully predict uh, uh, the next movement so you can prepare the organization for it um thanks uh, both for for answering that question uh, as sanjay said there's no perfect answer and i like both answers so um so this one is specifically for you uh, sanjay um when you look at the office of finance do you do you experience a, a greater need for collaboration and literally go outside of the office of finance in order for the office of finance to to function properly um how how does that manifest itself in uh, in shindla yeah um uh, i i'm very proud of the finance team uh, actually on this topic and thanks for asking this question um in fact the finance team basically the 
control, business controllers uh, in Schindler India were awarded the best customer uh, satisfaction survey uh, uh, kind of record, and they were considered as one of the top team performers. And uh, why? How did we build on this? It is one part that the monotonous and regular activity we have moved into our shared service. So what we have in the finance team uh, in business is basically all business enablers. Although the terminology used is business controllers, but I would say all of them are business enablers. And this strategy works excellent, but the kind of people you have has to be having that attitude to be collaborative. I cannot have someone coming from a fixed mindset that this is my responsibility. If the sales is not happening, my team will be following up and working with them what new we need to do. If, if there is maintenance things uh, not working fine or if the CSS code, external CSS codes drop, they'll be connecting as to what is going wrong. So uh, I would say uh, business finance cannot function alone now. Gone are the days when I can take a chartered accountant from uh, a CA institute and tell them, yeah, you are finance team and you can be the business enabler. The attitude and aptitude needs to be more business prone. Finance is the base, but more business prone. And all of these people, should be ready in such a way that if they are asked to take tomorrow a business role, they should be ready because they know all the levers which will help the organization to steer in the right direction. So I would say it is a long uh, journey because it can't be achieved overnight, but uh, it's definitely achievable, which I had experienced, and it is... Um, basically a play of attitude and aptitude uh, rather than having a finance set of knowledge. So, Do you see uh, that, that the other hmm. departments have the same uh, approach towards the Office of Finance? So clearly it sounds like you're, you described the need and, and you can only be successful in your office if you collaborate with hmm. the other departments. Do you see that also... Hmm. Uh, so that's an inside out. And do you also see that as an outside in other departments realizing they can't be successful without uh, a proper functioning office of finance? Does it work two ways? Yes, it is definitely two ways because uh, it can never be successful a single way uh, or from one way traffic. It is both ways. And how it is both ways is because I have to make it make it work for them. I cannot be just asking them questions. That's so old school thought. I have to work mm. with them that how I can help them achieve the organizational goals. And how can I help them achieve their KPIs rather than just thinking of monitoring financial parameters. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, it is definitely working both ways for us. And... Uh, what the team needs to also understand is don't go into questioning mode. Go into supportive mode. Definitely mm -hmm. not forgetting the basics, but it has to be a supportive mode. Yeah, I fully agree. I fully agree. True collaboration happens when 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 both are in listening mode and, and, and see how you can help the other other party, right, within the enterprise. I'm going to continue to another question for yourself, Sanja, whilst I have you uh, off, off the mute button. Um, how do you yeah. think you can leverage the financial data and insights that you capture within your business to further empower your offers, your team, and therefore probably become more relevant across uh, the entire enterprise. You talked about, you allude, alluded to that already a little bit, but if you now specifically focus on on data and insights that you have access to, how do you lever leverage that to, yeah, to become a, a, a true business partner with the other departments? 
Okay. Uh, let me start with, uh, I take care of IT, but uh, I would say I have a team which works only on data and power BI. So what we do is we collect the current problems which the business is suffering. That is one way of providing information. And second is if I see a struggling API. Then I work with the business team as to how I can help them achieve their targets and the goals, what they are looking for themselves better. So we make um, reports or information which is much easier to grasp, one, uh, much easier to comprehend and take it forward and it is very relevant. Let me share with you uh, the kind of reports that we usually give to most of them. It's an information overload. And if I look at the field operations, basically, they are practically on the road most of the time, either in, especially in Schindler, because they have to meet the customers, install it on the site, maintain the, uh, the units, and I see most of the people on the road. So for me, the data should be easily understandable, comprehensible, and easy to access. And that's why it has to be on mobile phone. But the most important part, I would say, in two steps is it has to be relevant for them at that point in time. And second, I need to handhold them to use it quite frequently. It does not happen that I send a report and they start using it like, oh, it's, it's quite interesting. No one is, not many people are data driven. So it's handholding part which helps us to kind of push it forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a great segue into Ravi, a question that I would like to ask yourself, uh, and maybe you can you can allude or also give us a bit of insight into the one that we're looking at here specifically. But then it comes to the tool, right? Uh, a modern planning solution. Uh, what tools do you use in order to uh, speed up the digitization journey to become more relevant? And like those insights that uh, Sanjay just talked about, that actually the receiving party becomes more familiar and the data that is represented coming from your office is actually really valuable uh, without having to be a data scientist. Right. So uh, with rapid advancement in uh, technology, right, there is immense opportunity to leverage data which the organization itself generates through the transactional systems to gain insights which can feed into the, you know, the planning uh, solution. Um, no, imagine, right, you you have uh, your uh, accounting system, vendor management system, customer management system. Now, imagine you, if you can, you know, have a platform where it all comes together and you run some data analytics. Um, and, and that throws up an interesting fact to say that, look, uh, uh, this particular customer in this particular city who is buying these, you know, products is also buying adjacencies or adjacent products to what you're selling. And, and let's say those adjacent products, the customer is buying from your uh, competitors, uh, but you also have some potential viable you know, solution or something which, which can take care of that particular need of the customer. Well, imagine you can always tailor a package for the customer. Uh, and even before you reach out to the customer, you can take these insights to your sales and marketing teams and tell them, hey, based on the data which we have put together from our customers, from, from our internal you know, sales data and whatever you know, we are generating at an SKU or an inventory or a supply chain you know, a databases, this is what is coming up. All these products are, are, are leading to this particular you know, customer. And is there an opportunity there to really create a comprehensive cap uh, package uh, for the customer? You now drive those discussions. And if the sales and marketing teams are convinced because they know the obviously their customers best, they can then you know go and pitch it to the customer. So the value addition which you are giving to the customer is instead of dealing with five different vendors for five different products, probably your yeah. company is able to serve uh, similar needs. Uh, we we had some tangible examples in our company because you know uh, ours is a diversified healthcare company. We had a sales team you know working on consumer products, uh, medical devices, and pharmaceutical. While standalone they are, but oftentimes there were the adjacencies or products which were very similar, and uh, and it was uh, you know 
when when we looked at the comprehensive data as one Johnson and Johnson, these these uh, you know insights uh, were really helpful to then you know uh, create better value uh, for the customer. So so that's where I believe that uh, a uh, linking to the previous point of collaboration, you you need to be in touch with your you know supply chain, your sales, your your marketing teams, and so on and so forth. And then uh, you you layer that collaboration with uh, the uh, the strong uh, information systems which you have and the insights which you can generate. That's a great combination to really drive your business. Yeah, uh, fully fully concur with uh, with your analysis. Uh, we actually have a, a question uh, online that that is that is almost connected to what you just said because all of this data is in all these different silos. What you're looking for is how do I get all of that data combined into almost one cube? And you can slice and dice that data and you can uh, gather intelligence out of it, uh, as you just described. Um, if that data doesn't come together somewhere and relating back to a modern planning solution is then you have all those silos that you discussed at the start, uh, Ravi. And so true integrated business planning requires you to capture all of that data and build a single source of truth, right? Um, that brings me to another question, uh, which we switch a little bit from technology to, uh, I guess, the, the human impact. Um, um, as, as you get almost uh, uh, more insightful as a, as a department of finance, uh, and then specifically to you, Ravi, within your business, um, with that also comes the uh, need for the team that that you run to become more articulate, be able to tell stories, uh, uh, change their behavior in how they collaborate with their colleagues across the business uh, and, and become that true true business partner. Um, are you seeing that within uh, within J&J &J as well and, and specifically how, how you're tackling this? Yeah, sure. Uh, in my experience, right, uh, uh, first and foremost is uh, you need to have a case for change, right? I mean, if you need to change behavior, well, there has to be a case why the behavior has to change. So let me take an example. You are either uh, you are a company which is either in a vacuum or on a roller coaster. What do I mean by that? You are in a vacuum, so nothing much. You are a, you are a very regulated entity, so therefore you know very less number of competition would come over a period of time. Uh, you know you have a very stable set of customers. The needs don't evolve as much. And your product innovation is also reasonable and not really, you know, uh, uh, going fast. So it's kind of a vacuum. Uh, in that case, well, there is very less case for change. It's going well, fine, continue. I hope, you know, I'm in such a business, you know, the work will be less. But no, the real world is on the roller coaster side where it's a twists and turns and, you know, the environment throws a lot of things at you. Uh, so the first thing is uh, to determine where you are on this continuum. If you are on the roller coaster side, uh, then I think you need to make a very strong case for change and why the change is required, right? Uh, so that, that's step number one, really making that case for change uh, uh, no, for the, for, to the organization. The number two one is uh, if you are trying to you know, change behavior, it's very tough. So therefore, the second step is really to expose uh, people whom, you know, where you're looking to influence some change to external uh, you know environment and when i say external it can be as simple as a small project in a let's say somebody in finance and you want to influence them and really make them more business focused maybe a short stint in commercial or supply chain or even a short project can work they can join seminars like these where they can interact uh, and connect with you know folks across different industries and so on and so forth so really then you know expose your team to to you know wider set of experiences the third step then would be to identify a few folks who have got inspired, right? And let them become your uh, evangelicals, right? Go around and really drive that change for you within the organization. Step four would be to then, you know, make it more sustainable by uh, putting some governance mechanism using carrot and stick approach and so on and so forth. And the step five would, step five would, uh, step five, sorry, would be to continuously measure progress uh, using some metrics and dashboards which are relevant for your organization uh, so that you can action any gaps or or any uh, explore any further opportunities. Uh, so I, I would say that has worked for me in the past in, in my different roles and it's working for, you, for me now as I'm in this transformation role and, 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 I, and I, you know, follow it. So just sharing very honestly, transparently uh, uh, on what worked for me. Uh, maybe something else work yeah. for, works for you, but it's important that you find what works for you and then, yeah, build upon it. 
Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll ask, I'll, I'll build on that uh, uh, people element that we're discussing here. Um, as I said on my introduction, I'm currently in, in Australia, met with uh, a number of uh, CFOs here, and consistently in each conversation is the great resignation, it's the war for talent, and it seems that here specifically in Australia, it's, it's, it's a real issue. Um, how do we attract talent, but also how do we retain the people that are currently on board? Let me ask both of you, uh, Sanja, you're uh, in India. Um, how is the war for talent there? How are you dealing with this? Sorry. I would say uh, uh, yeah. dealing uh, with uh, this is an uh, ever-evolving thing because we have not faced this uh, in long time. And um, although we knew about it, since this has been discussed since last year, but somewhere uh, we, I would say overall, undermine this thing, this area specifically. Um, but uh, I would say touch wood in, uh, in our organization, we started to drive on people since about 2018 with the change in our CEO. And he used to always talk people first. He talks always, always. And I would say as a finance person now, discussing KPI is one thing, and a parallel discussion always is people development and how do we motivate people to become a better version of themselves. It's never a topic that how do I make them fit for this organization. The topic is always how do I help them achieve their goals and their targets. And uh, I would say this is an organizational drive, but can I retain all? Probably no, because the salary increases that people in India are getting is 50-55%. Now, I can't just hold everyone back and just give them these increases because then the internal disparity is a big concern. So what we have started is also um, multitask, helping people multitask a bit to manage the gap, one. And second is speeding up the hiring process, which earlier used to be taking a bit longer, two interviews, three interviews. We are now, um, we, we have now revamped the whole interview process. How can we finalize a candidate in probably one interaction? Working on a panel for interviewing rather than having single interviews running for one hour uh, all the time. Um, this is a certain backup plan, I would say. The most important out of all this thing remains is communicating. Communicating with them being honest, as Ravi mentioned, being honest everywhere helps. You have to be honest with them that, yeah, what are the problems going on? What are we doing for them? What they can, why should they stay in the organization? How are they looking after them? This is all things which need to be communicated. But I would say a, one thing is greater resignation, but an, another thing which I don't know is prevalent in any part of um, world, but it's very prevalent in India, it's candidates backing out at the last moment. So I have rolled out an offer, the candidate has accepted it, done the medical test, background check, all done. Usually the, the notice period for them is two to three months, and we come to know probably a day before the joining date that the person is not joining. Yeah. And this yeah, it's... starts the whole whole chain to work again. I would say yeah. we are trying to work out. Do I have a solution? Again, no. I'm just trying to work out by revamping the interview process, communicating all the time, ensuring that we are here to meet their goals rather than meet the organization goals. Letting people go happily because that is one thing which they should be the... Uh, promoter for our organization, that's very critical as well. So I would say a lot of efforts around it, a lot of efforts around it, uh, 
has anyone been uh, able to manage it? No. I was talking to our auditors as well, and he mentioned that the attrition is 40 percent, and this is after giving a 20 percent salary increase across board. Do I get that wow. kind of uh, increase from my customer? Definitely no. No, no. So <laughs> it's an, I, an, would say, yeah. I would say, yeah. Yeah, no, so no. I, 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 it I, is I, a I, journey. It is certainly a journey. I like the point that you raise, and we have a chat panel open. So if somebody has cracked uh, this specific uh, problem, please uh, put your solution into the chat window because I think. We're all we're all very interested on how we can get that candidate the day before they're supposed to show up in the office uh, for them to actually uh, uh, show up. Uh, Ravi, are you experiencing the the same type of uh, of challenges? Yeah, I mean, I'm based in Singapore, and uh, at least in in, uh, in my my team and the uh, immediate you know teams with whom I work, uh, talent certainly continues to be um, a focus uh, topic. Uh, I would not say, uh, you know, be able to say whether it, it, it qualifies into the great resignation bucket, but it, it, it continues to be a persistent uh, challenge. And how do we address it? Uh, one thing we have, we have done uh, over the last many months is what we call as a personalized development plan. Uh, uh, you know, alluding to what um, Sandhya was just sharing, right? Uh, really, really communicating with each uh, individual, uh, understanding what is the plan they have made for themselves. Uh, and then building upon it to see where there is convergence between the plans they have for their career and what the organization has to offer. Now, in, in many cases, it will work out because either, you know, you, uh, you, you inspire the employee to look beyond what they have for themselves and there are opportunities within the organization where you can fit in or uh, new roles are coming up in the organization which were not there previously. But because you're having this communication and the employee is letting you know what their uh, you know aspirations are, you are able to then match them proactively uh, rather than they thinking that this that organization doesn't have this role, so let me move on, right? So those things are happening. But all said and done, there will be individuals who will find that uh, 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 you know if, if they are looking at their career goals and aspirations, what the organization is providing probably doesn't match and they will move. And that's probably good for both for them and for us because, again, the idea is to make sure that, you know, whoever the talent is, whether they stay or they leave, uh, it works for them and they grow, you know, uh, and do in life, right? That's that's the whole, uh, yeah. that, that gives you satisfaction, right? Either which way. So, so but really coming back to the personalized development plan and really for the managers to spending time with their teams uh, and, and doing these conversations on a regular basis, having a framework of personalized development plan seems to be working out. Yeah. Uh, right, but uh, but again, uh, when there is so much opportunity out there, uh, uh, retention rates uh, will will come down. Attrition will inch up, uh, and we have to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a tough uh, challenge. Uh, I, I I'm not in the office of finance uh, myself. I run I run the business for APAC, and I'm experiencing ex exactly the same uh, problems as as you just highlighted. Uh, we have a few questions also in the chat box. I want to make sure that we address those uh, before uh, we run out of time here. Um, here's a question for, for both of you. Uh, keeping in view the importance of data, what do you think is the right place for the data analysts to be part of which team? Where should, they, where should the data analysts sit? Should they sit within a separate department? Should they sit within the Office of Finance, IT? Do you have a specific point of view on on that topic? And this is a question for for both of you. So, uh, you know, if you feel strongly about the topic, go ahead. Um, uh, maybe maybe I'll I'll give it a shot. Um, uh, I think uh, there is no right or or wrong department to be in. It all depends on. Uh, what exactly are you looking at uh, as an output from this data analyst, right? Um, and what kind of data is this data analyst going to deal with? If it's about dealing with very technical IT you know, stuff, uh, probably the analyst has to move towards more towards the IT kind of uh, you know, teams. If it's more about uh, financial you know, stuff, 
then probably in finance. And if it's more about marketing, you know, data, which the individual is analyzing, then, you know, probably they will sit in there. But it's a, if, if it's a combination where it's a financial elements, but also generating business insights, uh, probably there's a case for this uh, person to sit in finance. It's, it's less important where this individual is based or which department this individual is in. It's more important whether this individual collaborates with the ecosystem in which he or she is working and really delivers on those insights which this particular individual is you know, coming up with. I would say that's more critical. The lesser question would be which department, right? I mean, that, that we can always sort it out as far as it's a, as long as it's a collaborative environment, uh, I think I think you can certainly figure it out. So that that's how I would I would go uh, with it uh, rather than you know really going for a siloed approach of this department or that department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, we, uh, I see that in my discussions is that a data scientist seems to be a job profile uh, more and more uh, CFOs are hiring for instead of a pure accountant, right? Okay, um, I got another question here. Um, how frequent does your organization revise, review uh, the budget and planning uh, uh, results? So is there a rolling forecasting methodology that you both apply? And let me start with you, uh, Sanja. Um, what is, do you apply that within Schindler? You're on mute. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. So whilst you're sorting out that technical problem, uh, Ravi, um, how, how do you guys do that within um, uh, within J and J? Yeah, um, I mean uh, we are currently going through a transformation. Uh, as part of this transformation exercise, uh, we are moving on from a quarterly, you know, uh, uh, review processes to a more rolling forecast uh, kind of uh, methodology. Uh, so answer is as simple as that, you know, because because given uh, what our customer, how, how frequently customer needs are changing in the dynamic environment, we believe that that's, that's uh, the right uh, thing for us. So therefore, uh, moving on from a more quarterly kind of reviews to, to rolling forecast is uh, what we are uh, endeavoring to do now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um... No, thanks for that. I, I, the most companies that we interact with, uh, and clearly they, they speak to Jetox because they have a need for a rolling forecast driver based. Um, we see that they are coming from an environment where it was not continuous, um, but they're seeking help because the dynamics of the outside world is things are changing so rapidly. So there's a, a clear need for constant planning. Um, I've got two uh, technical questions, uh, and I'm gonna. I'm just gonna throw it out there and see uh, which one of you two would like to answer this. Um, is your budgeting and planning process digitized? Um, and if so, uh, did you build uh, an in-house tool? Did you design it yourself, or did you procure something from outside? And actually, they're specifically asking for recommendations. Let me, I mean, I handle the recommendations. I think Jetox would be a great recommendation. Um, but Ravi, um, are you, mm -hmm. have you got an in-house build set up or do you have a, uh, a, did you actually procure a vendor? Yeah, we, um, uh, we don't have an in-house uh, solution for our uh, planning solution. We have gone with an external uh, vendor with whom we are working. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Sanja, have you been able to reconnect? Yes, Mark. Uh, the hey, technology thing is so well. It's overwhelming. <laughs> okay. yeah, no, no problem. I would like to go back to the previous question, actually, um, which was in regards to continuous planning. Um, are you uh, uh, reviewing it? Um, what's your review period on, on planning? Are you doing that every month? Are you doing it weekly? Or is it, or is it still every quarter? Uh, it's monthly uh, for the group review, but I would say uh, internally it's every week because uh, not a very detailed one, but a very high level one where I, rather not me personally, but my team works with the field operations. 
and kind of knows where the month is going to end. So that's more weekly, but overall uh, for the group submissions, it is at month level. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good to hear. Thank you. Um, I'll have a final question for both of you. Um, as, as I'm hearing it here, um, moving, automating um, your, your most critical data is probably your financial data within, within the organizations that you work for. One of the big concerns if you start automating and you go from a legacy environment into a new environment is, is cost and risk of migration. Um, you know, are we going to lose a couple of zeros on the way? And if so, then clearly uh, uh, you're going to be held responsible. Um, how do you deal with with that risk of migration uh, during that digitization journey where you keep improving uh, processes, you keep buying new technology, new tools? Um, Ravi, do you have, a, as, a, as a transformation lead within the Office of Finance, do you have a view? Yeah, it's a, it's certainly a continuous uh, uh, journey, and therefore uh, it's very very important for you to make a decision on what tools and technologies you are going to use. Now, certain decisions mm -hmm. probably you will make once in a while, and and that certainly used to be the case earlier. But with the rapid evolving of uh, technology, I think you need to really look for solutions uh, which are more agile in the sense where the software can. Uh, uh, really, you know, give you or the vendor can really give you uh, things uh, uh, what you need uh, and can stay as a true partner for a long period of time. It's it's less about I buy a product today and I'm done with it and next five years I'm not going to look at it. No, it's more about really partnering with your vendor and uh, in in this journey and building on those bells and whistles as you, you know require it uh, and as you progress along your journey. So I would say look for a partner, look for a partnership. Uh, uh, with a technology provider who would uh, you know, help you out uh, and, and go with it. Or if you have an in-house technology uh, you know, department and they have been doing this uh, you know, in the past, well, go with them and you know, co-create the solutions along with them. Yeah, no, that's a very fair point. Um, Sanja, do you have a, a specific point of view on, on how to deal with migra risk of migration as you move through this digitization journey? Yeah. Uh, if you go traditionally, when the past migration used to happen, uh, you would have a team of mixed uh, mixed bag. A, pe a lot of people who were long in the organization who would know the business and the processes well, and a bunch of newbies who know the latest technology well. With the great resignation, I don't know if we can continue to have the mixed bag yet. One uh, And the migration process, Usually what I have experienced in past has been very tiring. Do we have that kind of time to go through the migration process? I would say no. Um, any tool now, as Ravi mentioned rightly, has to be coming up with solutions which kind of works with now to mobile. You can just migrate the data without, without really doing anything with the code. And that is where the world needs to move. We can't have people being working on migration projects for a year or more. I don't think the mm. the overheads allow us to spend that kind of money. True, 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 right. true. And and Mark, I see. And Mark, I see. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm very passionate about technology. So if I can give a very specific, you know, example. Um, uh, you know, if you had uh, uh, J Johnson and Johnson is a very you know large organization, very decentralized, and there were a lot of you know ERP systems we have within the company across the globe, right? If you had asked me like five to ten years ago, uh, uh, what would be a, a good uh, you know idea to really bring it all together? Probably I would have told you, uh, well, all these ERPs, you know, take it away, bring in one ERP for the whole organization, right? Now theory mm. looks good. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, it'll, it'll get just shot down because of the huge amount of capital expenditure you'll have to do, right? But today, there, are, there is technology which exists, which can act, which can sit as a layer on top of all your ERPs and pull the data in. And it itself acts as an ERP. There are, I, I don't want to take any brand or brand names here, but, but the, those technologies exist if you look around. And, and those yeah. are the ones, right? Because the technology has evolved, you can, you can really think innovatively 
and and really leverage the power of data much more easily cost effective manner than what probably you you would have to do maybe even 5 to 10 years ago yeah yeah and and you're mentioning a top uh, you're you're saying something that coincidentally there's a question that just popped up uh, where this individual is asking for a migration to be more effective do you think that partnering with a vendor is a better approach than developing it with an in-house team um, I, I, I half heard your answer, but maybe you want to address this uh, question specifically: in-house partnering or partnering with uh, with with the vendor of choice. I would I would uh, uh, say there is no either or, and uh, a good solution or a, or a bad solution. I think it again depends on uh, your particular situation. If you have a in-house you know team. Uh, which is technically very competent, uh, very agile, very connected with the business uh, and understands your business and, and is able to deliver it on time, well, go for that, right? And if you, if, if that doesn't exist, uh, well, then you have to look for an external partner. So I would not say it's an either or. And, and there can be a situation where you can have a partnership, right? You can have, bring in an external vendor. You can assess the capabilities of your internal team and where you see certain gaps where it's not yet there and you want to build it, of course, within the team. But let's say in the short term, you want to bridge those gaps, then work with an external partner who can help you bridge that interim gap. So any, yeah. it can work. It all depends on you know, a particular situation in which your organization is in and how you then you know, want to build it further. That, that's what, uh, I, that is how I would frame it. Fantastic. Um, we're, we're, we're through all the questions uh, asked online. Uh, if there's more questions coming later, then I'm sure um, we'll find a way to get you answers in a, in a written form or a, or a follow-up email. Uh, but Svetlana, may I hand back over to you? Of course, and thank you, Mark, and thank you all for sharing these great insights indeed and for being so generous with your time today. Uh, just a quick reminder to look out for an email within the next two hours to download today's materials. And in addition, also, I would like to mention that JEDOX works with companies around the world to help streamline their budgeting, forecasting, and planning processes. And if you would like to learn more how it can be done for your company, you can book a meeting directly with uh, our dear host and the webinar, Mark, uh, or request a JEDOX demo through which is book a meeting and request a demo. We'd also like your feedback, so if you could take a minute to answer our very brief survey that will pop up at your, on your screen at the end of the session, that would be very much appreciated. On behalf of JEDOX and Marcus Evans webinars, we would like to thank you all for joining us today, and we do hope that you will be listening in at our next webinars. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.